My mom has a permanently stuck in the 80s thing. We're talking teased up feathered hair, acid washed denim jacket, and shoulder pads. So many shoulder pads. But I just got a new phone from AT&T. And check this out. I got a second phone to gift my mom. So now she can finally ditch her old one for a phone that can actually stream all the 80s shows she loves. Come into an AT&T store and find out how to get a smartphone on us. AT&T. More for your thing. That's our thing. See store for details. History Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Knight. This is part two, the Syrian Civil War. I strongly suggest you listen to part one. However, it isn't essential. There is further information, uh, more relevant, up-to-date information in part two, so you can listen to part two um, without this part one if you wanted to. This is Brief History Podcast, comprehensive history packed in under an hour, Perfect for your commute home, on your lunch break, or in your precious time. Thank you for everybody who's reached out to us over social media recently, uh, specifically to Marcus Staple, Mark Zimmers, Marissa Chad, Marie Griggs, and Heather Isaacs. Your comments were very uh, helpful. Um, thank you for your kind words. Uh, we're across most social networks we're on facebook instagram snapchat and twitter we're at a b history podcast for all of those please find us please engage with us we love hearing from you let us know if you there's any um tips uh, anything you like or dislike about the uh, the podcast we really want to hear from you um, as of other episodes we have uh, read out um your feedback so uh, we will continue to do so um, please, uh, please be, be in touch. Uh, if you could leave a five-star review, it would very much help. Uh, take seconds, but it really does uh, make a podcast. And like any new podcast, we rely on the generosity of the listeners. So please, uh, please help us out. Make that your good deed of the day. Leave us a five-star review. We are on all major podcast directories. Please subscribe. Um, reason for that is you get notified every time a new episode is released leaves you from searching uh, you guys don't have to do anything further um, we're on apple we're on uh, google we're on tune in stitcher um, all the main places you listen to podcasts um, so find us there in part one the syrian civil war we talked about how it was an ongoing multi-sided armed conflict in Syria fought preliminary through between the Ba'athist Syrian Arab Republic led by President Bashar Assad along with its allies of various forces posing both the government and another in varying constellations. This unrest in Syria, part of a wave of a wider 2011 Arab Spring protest grew out of discontent with the Assad government and escalated to armed conflict after process calling for his removal was violently suppressed. The war is still being fought on several factions. The Syrian government and its international allies, a loose alliance of Sunni Arabella groups, including the Free Syrian Army, the majority Kurdish Syrian Democratic Forces, the SDF, Salafi jihadist groups, including Al Nusri Front, and the Islamic State of Iraq and Lebanon, ISIL. A number of countries in the region and beyond either directly involved or provided support to one another faction, uh, namely Russia, Iran and Hezbollah, so supported by Syrian government military, with Russia conducting air operations since September 2015. On the other hand, the US-led international coalition established in 2014 with declared purpose of countering ISIL, then conducted 
airstrikes against ISIL in Syria, as well as against government and pro-government targets. Turkey, on the other hand, has become deeply involved since 2016 and beyond actively supporting the Syrian occupation, large swathes of Syria, northern Syria. International organizations has accused the Syrian government, ISIL and Syria rebel groups of severe human rights violation, um, including recent chemical weapons attacks and of many other massacres. This conflict is called a major refugee crisis. Over the course of the war, a large number of peace initiatives have been launched, including the March 2014 Geneva talks, based um, led by the United Nations. Uh, but as of yet, the fighting still continues. On the 21st of May, ISIL took control of Panera, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, after eight days of fighting. The jihadists have also captured the nearby towns of Al Sakanda and Maraya as well as several oil fields. Following the capture of Paliara, ISIL conducted mass executions in the area, killing an estimated 217 to 329 government civilian supporters and soldiers, according to opposition activists. Government sources put the number of killed at 400 to 450. By early June, ISIL reached the town of Hesari, which lies on the main road from Damascus to Homs and the Katia and reportedly took up positions west of it, creating a potential disaster for the government and raising the threat of Lebanon being sucked further into the war. On the 25th of June, ISIL launched two offences. One was a spies diversionary attack on Kobani, while the second targeted government held parts at al Qasqar city. The ISIL offensive of Arkasaki replaced displaced 60,000 people, with the UN estimating a total of 200,000 would be displaced. In July 2015, a raid by US Special Forces on a compound housing the Islamic State's chief financial officer, Abu Siyaf, produced evidence that Turkish officials directly dealt with ranking ISIS members. ISIS captured Quarantan City from the government on the 5th of August 2015. Australia joined the bombing of ISIL in Syria in mid-September, an ex extension of their efforts in Iraq for the last year. On the 2nd of August, two US officials informed Reuters the United States had decided to allow airstrikes to help defend against any attack on the US-trained Syrian rebels even if the attacks came from forces loyal to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The following day, the Pentagon announced that it would be flying its first unmanned dr armed drone missions in Syria. On the 30th of September 2015, in response to an official request by the Syrian government, the Russian Aerospace Forces began a sustained component of airstrikes against both ISIL and the anti-Assad FCSA. Initially, the raids were conducted solely by Russian aircraft station Kamini base in Syria. Shortly after the start of the Russian occupation, US President Barack Obama was reported to have authorised the resupply of Syrian Kurds, the Arab Syrian opposition. Obama reportedly emphasised to his team that the US would continue to support the Syrian opposition now that Russia had joined the conflict. On the 7th of October 2015, Russian officials said the ships of the Caspian Flotilla had earlier fired C-26 sea-based missiles at 11 ISIL targets in Syria, destroying those of and causing no civilian casualties. That day, the Syrian government launched the Northwest Syrian offences that in the following few days succeeded in recapture some of territory in northern Hama Governorate close to the government's coastal heartline in the west of the country. On 8th October 2015, the US officially announced the end of the Pentagon's half billion dollar program to train and equip the Syrian rebels and acknowledged it had been failed. However, other covert and significantly larger CIA programs to arm anti-government fighters in Syria continued. Two weeks after the start of the Russian campaigns in Syria, the New York Times opinion that with anti-government commanders receiving for the first time 
bountiful supplies of US-made anti-tank missiles and with Russia raising the number of airstrikes against the government's opponents that had raised morale in both camps, broadening war objectives and hardening political positions, the conflict was turned into an all-out proxy war between the US and Russia. Despite multiple top-ranking casualties incurred by the Iran forces advising fighters in Syria, in mid-October, the Russian-Syrian-Iranian Hezbollah offensive targeting rebels in Aleppo went ahead. At the end of October 2015, the US Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter signaled a shift in the strategy of US-led campaign, saying that there would be more airstrikes and ruling in use of direct ground raids. The fight in Syria concentrated mostly on Raqqa. On 30th of October and two weeks later, Syrian peace talks were held in Vienna, initiated by the United States, Russia, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, in which on 30th of October, Iran participated for the first time in negotiations on Syrian settlement. The participants disagreed on the future of Bashar Assad. On the 10th of November 2015, the Syrian government forces completed the operation to break through the Islamic State insurgents' blockade of the Kurez Air Base in Aleppo province. The government forces have been under siege since April 2013. In mid-November 2015, in the wake of the Russian planned bombing over Sinai and the Paris attacks, both Russia and France significantly intensified their strikes in Syria, France closely coordinating with the US military. On the 17th of November, Putin said he had issued orders for the cruiser Moskov that had been in the eastern Mediterranean since the start of the Russian operations to work as an ally with the French naval group led by flagship Charles de Gaulle that had been on their way to western eastern Mediterranean since early November. Shortly afterwards, a Russian foreign ministry official criticised France's stridently anti-Assad stance, as well as France airstrikes at oil and gas installations in Syria, as apparently designed to prevent those from returning under the Syrian government's control. The Russian official pointed out that such strikes by France could not be justified as they've been carried out with Syrian government's consent. In his remarks to a French delegation that included French parliamentarians on the 14th of November, President Bashar Assad sharply criticised France as well as other Western states' actions against the Syrian government, suggesting that France supported the Syrian opposition forces had led to the Islamic State claim attacks in Paris. On the 19th of November 2015, the UN Secretary Council would fail to involve the UN's Chapter 17, which gives specific legal authorization for the use of the force. Unanimously passed Resolution 2249 that urged UN members to redouble and coordinate their efforts to prevent and suppress terrorist acts committed specifically by ISIL, also known as Daesh, as well as ANF and all other individuals, groups, undertakings and entities associated with Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, as designated by the United Nations Security Council, as many further to be agreed by International Syrian Support Group, ISSG, and endorsed by the UN Security Council. The adopted resolution was drafted by France and co-sponsored by the UK the following day after Russia introduced an updated version of its previously submitted draft resolution that was blocked by Western powers as seeking to legitimise Assad's authority. On the 24th of November 2015, Turkey shot down a Russian warplane that allegedly violated Turkish airspace and crashed in northwestern Syria, leading to the Russian pilot's death. Following the crash, it was reported that Syrian Turkmen rebels from Syrian Turkmen brigades attacked and shot down a Russian rescue helicopter, killing a Russian naval infantryman. A few days after, Russian aircraft was reported to have struck targets in the Syrian town of Riha in Idlib province, 
that was controlled by the Army of Conquest, causing multiple casualties on the ground. On the 2nd of de December 2015, the Parliament of the United Kingdom voted to expend Operation Shadar in Syria with a majority of 397 to 223. That day, two British tornado aircraft took up from RF Aktorturi immediately at 22.30, each carrying three powered wave bombs. Two further aircraft were deployed at 08.30 on the 3rd of December, and all aircraft returned by 630 with their bombs. Defence Secretary Michael Fallon said that the strikes hit the Omar oil forwards in western Syria and that eight more jets, two tornadoes and six typhoons were being sent to by the RAF to join the eight already there. On the 7th of December 2015, the government of Syria announced that the US-led coalition warplanes had fired nine missiles at its army camp near Ayash the Azor province on the evening prior, killing three soldiers and wounding 13 others. Three armoured vehicles, four military vehicles, heavy machine guns and the arms and ammunition depot were also destroyed. The government condemned the strikes, the first time the government force would be struck by the coalition as an act of flagrant aggression. The coalition spokesman denied it was responsible. Anonymous Pentagon officials claimed later in that the, the day that Pentagon was certain that a Russian warplane, presumably a Tu-22 bomber, had carried out the attack. The claim was denied by the Russian military spokesman. On the 14th of December 2015, Russia's government news media reported that Syrian government forces retook Marj al satan military airbase east of Damascus that had been held by Jahaz al-Islam. The UN Resolution 2254 of the 18th of December 2015 that endorsed the ISSG's transitional plan but did not clarify who would represent the Syrian opposition while condemning terrorist groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda, it made no mention of the future role of Syrian President Bashar Assad. On the 12th of January 2016, the Syrian government announced its four Army and Allied forces had established full control of the strategically situated town of Salma, whose pre-war population was predominantly sunny in the northwestern province of Lekia and continued to advance north. On the 16th of January 2016, ISIL militants launched a raid on government-held areas in the city of Deir el Azor and killed up to 300 people. Counter-strikes by Russian Air Force fighter jets in support of Syrian armed forces reported to take back the areas. On the 21st of January 2016, Russia's activity presumably aimed to set up a new base in the government-controlled Kameshli airport was first reported. The northeastern town of Kameshli in al Kasaka governor had largely under the Syrian Kurds control since the start of the Syrian Kurdish Islamic conflict in the governor of al Hashkar in July 2013. Similar activity by the US forces was suspected in the Rumelan air base in the same province, 50 kilometers, 31 miles away from Kameshli airport. The area is likewise controlled by the US-backed Kurdish People's Protection Units, the YPG. On the 24th of January 2016, the Russian government, or sorry, the Syrian government announced its forces carrying on with the Lakia offensive had seized the predominantly sunny populated town of Rabia, the last major town held by rebels in western Lakita province. Russian forces were said to have played an important role in the recapture. The capture of Rabia was said to threaten rebel supply lines from Turkey. By the 26th of January 2016, the Syrian government established full control of the town of al shikar Maskin in the Darara governor, thus completed the operation that had begun in late December 2015. The town's capture by the Syrian government was marked as, quote, turning off the tide in the Syrian war, end quote, by Al Jazeera.
On the 26th of February 2016, the United Nations Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 2268 that endorsed a previously brokered US-Russia deal on a cessation of hostilities. The ceasefire started on the 27th of February 2016 at 0 hundred hours Damascus time. The ceasefire does not include attacks on UN designated terrorist organisations. At the close of February 2016, despite individual clashes, the truce was reported to hold. By the end of March, the Syrian government forces, with support from Russia and Iran, successfully captured Pal Moira from the ISIL. By early July 2016, the truce was said to have mostly unraveled. Violence again escalated and the fighting between all major parties to the conflict continued. At the end of July 2016, the fighting between the government and the Islamic rebels in around Aleppo intensified. On the 12th of August 2016, the Syrian Democratic Forces fully captured Manbij from ISIL. Some days later, the SDF announced a new offensive towards Al-Bab, which could eventually connect the Kyrgyz regions in northern Syria. A few days after the Battle of Al-Haskar began, on the 22nd of August, the Kurdish YPG, having captured Gawara, the only major Arab neighbourhood in Hasake, had been in government hands, launched a major assault to seize the last government controlled areas of northeastern Syria city of Askaki, after a Russian mediation team failed to mend the rift between the two sides. The next day, the capture of the city was completed. A few days prior, the Pentagon admonished the Syrian government against interfering with coalition forces or partners in that region, adding that the US had the right to bend its troops. On the 24th of August 2016, Turkey's armed forces evaded Syria in Jabalas area controlled by ISIL stated, starting that the Turkish government called Operation Euphrates Shield, aimed against, according to a statement, both the ISIS and Kurdish, quote, terror groups that threatened our country in northern Syria, end quote. The Syrian government denounced the intervention as a blatant violation of its sovereignty and said that, quote, fighting terrorism isn't done by ousting ISIS and replacing it with other terrorist organizations backed directly by Turkey, end quote. The PYD leader, Salih Muslim, said that Turkey was now in the Syrian quagmire and would be defeated like ISIS. Speaking in Kari the same day, US Vice President Joe Biden indirectly endorsed Turkey's move and said that the US had made it clear to the Syrian Turkey Kurdish forces that they should move back east across the Euphrates or lose US support. As Turkish troops and the Turkish aligned Syrian rebels took control of Jarabulas and moved further south towards the Syrian town of Manjib, they clashed with the Kurdish YPG which led the US officials to voice concerns and issued a warning to both sides. On the 29th of August, US Defense Secretary Ash Carter specified that the US did not support Turkey's about South of Jabalas. The warning as well as an announcement by the US of tentative ceasefires between the Turkish forces and the Kurds in the area of Jarabulas was promptly and angrily disposed by Turkish officials. However, combat between the Turkish forces and the SDF denied, died down and instead Turkish forces moved east to confront ISIS. In the meantime, the SDF, including Western volunteers, continued to reinforce Manbij. At sunset on the 12th of September 2016, a US-Russian brokered ceasefire came into effect. Five days later, the US and other coalition members Jet bombed Syrian army positions near Deir Azor, reportedly by accident, but with Russian contender that it was an international, killing at least 62 Syrian troops that were fighting ISIL militants. Shortly after the ceasefire broke down, and on the 19th of September, the Syrian army declared no longer observed the truce. Also on the 19th of September, 
an aid convoy in Aleppo was attacked, with the US coalition blaming the Syrian Russian government for the attack, and that's the same governments denying these accusations and instead blaming terrorists of the attack. The 22nd of September, the Syrian army declared a new offensive in Aleppo. The offensive succeeded on the 14th of December when the final rebel stronghold in Aleppo was recaptured by the Syrian government, followed by a ceasefire agreement. On the 26th of October 2016, US Defence Secretary Ash Carter said that an offensive to retake Raqqa from ISIS will begin within weeks. The SDF proceeded with its efforts in Operation Wrath of Eurasis. This operation used up 30,000 Arab, Christian, Kurdish troops with support from Western Coalition. By December 2016, it captured many villages and land west of Raqqa, previously controlled by ISIS. By January 2017, much of the land west of Raqqa had been seized and the second phase of the operation was complete. In December 2016, Syrian government forces completely recaptured all rebel-held parts of Aleppo, ending the four-year battle in the city. On the 15th of December, it was reported government forces were on the brink of retaking all of Aleppo, a turning point in the civil war. Assad celebrated the liberation of the city and stated, quote, history is being written by every Syrian citizen, end quote. On the 29th of December, 2016, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced a new ceasefire deal which had been reached between the Syrian government and the opposition groups, with Russia and Turkey acting as guarantors and Iran as a signatory to a tri trilateral agreement. The ceasefire came in effect at 0 hundred hours Syrian time on the 30th of December. It does not include UN designated ISIL troops such as ISIL and Jabhat Fatah Asham. Syrian High Negotiation Committee representatives in Turkey confirmed they were involved in the deal. Talks were scheduled to be held between the groups of Anstani, the capital of Kazakhstan, on the 15th of January. Early reports indicated that despite sporadic fighting incidents, the ceasefire appeared to be holding with no civilian deaths. Also late on the 29th of December, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reported that 4 million people in Damascus and surrounding areas were without, without reliable access to water after major supply infrastructure was subject to deliberate targeting on the 22nd of December. They said that although the government had initiated a programme of rationing, they were concerned that safe water may not be accessible to everyone and called on parties to reach peaceful agreements to guarantee basic services. On the 2nd of January 2017, Rebel troops said that they were disengaged from planned talks that after alleged ceasefire violations by government forces in the Wadi Barada Valley near Damascus. The government says the region is excluded from the ceasefire because of the presence of Fatah al-Sham, but some local activists deny that they have a presence there. At the end of January, government forces managed to capture Wadi Barada and the water supply of Damascus was returned. On the 14th of February 2017, the ceasefire between Assad forces and the rebels collapsed throughout the country, leading to fresh clashes in various locations and the fresh rebel offences in Dara. A new peace conference in Geneva was held on the 23rd of February. On the 23rd of February, Turkish forces captured Al Bab from ISIL in north east of Aleppo. The Syrian government forces started an offensive east of Aleppo to conquer Daya Hafer from ISIL and prevent further Turkish advances. On the 17th of March, Syrian militaries fired S-200 missiles at Israeli jets over Golan Heights. The Israel military claimed that the Arrow anti-ballistic system inter intercepted one missile, while the Syrian, Syrian military claimed they had downed an Israeli jet. The Russian Foreign Ministry summoned the Israeli ambassador to clarify the situation. 
on the 20th of March, 150 civilians were killed in the al badi school massacre by a US strike. The Syrian Arab army entered Daya Hafar, the last stronghold held by Islamic State in East Aleppo on the 23rd of March and secured it by the 23rd of March. This opened up an opportunity to push south in our Iraqi governor where Islamic State de facto capital resides. However, on the 23rd of March, a Syrian Democratic Forces contingent landed on a peninsula west of Raqqa via boats and helicopters in an effort to cut off the Arab, Syrian Arab army from entering the Islamic State's de facto capital Raqqa. On the 28th of March, agreement was reportedly brokered by Qatar and Iran for the ex evacuation of four, four besieged towns in Syria where around 60,000 people lived. The deal included evacuating residents at Afara and Kafia. Two towns in the governor besieged by rebel forces in exchange for the evacuation of residents and rebels in Zabani, Madaya towns under siege by government forces in the Rif Damascus governor. From April 2017, the United States took on a more confrontational strategy in Syria. After the Kamalakil attack on Khan Shakur, which American officials blamed on the Syrian government, warships of the US Navy launched 59 Tomahawk missiles at the Syrian government's Surat air base, which was said to be the source of the chemical attack. The American attack taking place on the 17th of April was the first officially announced deliberate attack on Syrian government forces. Due to be launched without authorization from the United States Congress or the United Nations Security Council, the strike triggered an emergency UNSS meeting, initially requested by Bolivia and supported by Russia. A spokesman for Vladimir Putin, Putin stated that Russian President viewed the US attack as, quote, an act of aggression against a sovereign country violating the norms of international law and under a trumped up pretext at that, end quote. This view was shared by Deborah Perstein, who had suggested the US military strikes against Syrian government forces violated the UN Charter, a cornerstone of international law which has been ratified by the US and thus binding on the US. In response, the US con representatives at the UNSC emergency meeting said that, quote, the moral stain of the Assad regime could no longer go unanswered, end quote. American forces which struck the, the Syrian military again on the 13th of May, when a Syrian army convoy advanced in the vicinity of the border town of al Tana, which hosted a US-controlled air base used for training of anti-government forces, came under attack by US fighter jets. Nevertheless, the Syrian government's desert offensive continued, and on the 9th of June, government forces secured a part of the Syrian-Iraqi border for the first time since 2015. This isolated the al Tanaf rebel area from Daesh held territory, the capture of which was staked as an official objective by both the rebels and the US forces. Meanwhile, intensive fighting between the government forces and rebel, rebel groups that began north of Hama on the 21st of March continued. By the 29th of March, the SAAA, which had halted the rebel offensive at the outskirts of Hama, began a counterstroke on the, the 16th of April had reversed all rebel gains. They proceeded to launch a smaller assault of their own and by the end of April had captured the towns of Halfaya and Taiba al Imam. On the 12th of April, the agreement to exchange the inhabitants of the rebel towns of Zar, Badani and Madaya with the inhabitants of the pro-government towns of Afua and Kafaya began to be implemented. On the 15th of April, a convoy of buses carrying evacuees from al Fia and Kafia was attacked by a suicide bomber in Aleppo, killing more than 126 people. On the 24th of April, the Turkish Air Force conducted several airstrikes on YPG and YPJ positions near al Mikalaya, killing at least 20 of their fighters. The attacks were condemned by the US. 
on the 4th of May 2017, Russian, Iran and Turkey signed an agreement in Astana to create four de-escalated zones in Syria. The four zones included Idlib, Governor, the northern rebel-controlled parts of Homs, Governor, the rebel-controlled eastern Ghouta and the Jordan-Syria border. The agreement was rejected by some rebel groups and the Democratic Union Party also denounced the deal, saying that the ceasefire zones were, quote, dividing Syria up on a sectarian basis, end quote. The ceasefire came into effect on the 6th of May. On the 7th of July 2017, the US, Russia and Jordan agreed to ceasefire in part of southwestern Syria. Russia gave assurances that Assad would be abided by the agreement. On the 19th of July 2017, it was reported that Donald Trump administration had decided to halt the CIA program to equip and train anti-government rebel groups, a move sought by Russia. On the 5th of September 2017, the government Central Syria Offensive culminated in the breaking of the three-year ISIL siege of Deir al-Zor with active participation of Russian aviation and navy. This was followed shortly thereafter by the lifting of the siege of the city's airport. On the 17th of October 2017, after four months of fierce fighting, the US-led coalition's bombardment, the Turkish-dominated Syrian Democratic Forces announced they had established full control of the city of Raqqa in northern Syria, previously the de facto capital of Iceland. At the end of October, the government of Syria said that it still considered Raqqa to be an occupied city that can, quote, only be considered liberated when the Syrian Arab army entered it, end quote. By mid-November 2017, the government forces allied militia established full control of Deir al-Zor and captured the town of Abu Kamal in eastern Syria near the border with Iraq and Iraq's town of Aqwam which was concurrently captured from ISIL by the Iraq government. On the 28th of November 2017, it was reported that China will be deploying troops to aid Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. On the 6th of December 2017, Russian government declared Syria to be, quote, completely liberated, end quote, from ISIL. On the 11th of December, Russian President Vladimir Putin visited a Russian base in Syria, where he announced that he had ordered the partial withdrawal of forces deployed to Syria. On the 26th of December, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shigou said that Russia set about, quote, forming a permanent grouping, end quote, at its naval facility at Turtus and Hamayan Air Base. Two days later, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said that Russia believed that the US forces must leave Syrian territory completely once the remnants of the terrorists were completely eliminated, and that would happen very soon. In January, February 2018, the Syrian army and its allies continued to advance against the forces Tar Asha and other rebels in the Hamad government. Meanwhile, on the 20th of January, the Turkish military began a cross-border operation in the Kurdish majority Afrin Canton and the Tarifik area of Shaba Canton in northern Syria against the Turkish-led Democratic Union Party in Syria, or PYD, its armed wing People's Protection Unit, YPG, and Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF positions. On the 10th of February 2018, the Syrian air defence shot down an Israeli F-16 fighter jet in response to a cross-border raid conducted by Israel on Iranian targets near Damascus through Lebanese airspace. The pilot survived the crash but had been transported for treatment. On the 21st of February 2018, the government began an operation to capture rebel Hal Ghouta east of Damascus the operation started with an intensive air campaign. On the 18th of March 2018, on the 58th day of the Turkish military operation in Afra, the Turkish-backed Free Syrian Army, the TFSA, and the Turkish Armed Forces captured Afrin from the YPG 
and the YPJ with the Kurds putting up little resistance. Shortly after the capture, the TFSA militants looted parts of the city and destroyed numerous pro-Kurdish symbols as Turkish army troops solidified control by raising Turkish flags and banners over the city. Thank you for listening to part two of the Syrian Wars by the Brief History podcast. I've been your host, Andrew Knight. Uh, Thank you for the music producing and sound by Harry Edmondson. Please listen to episode three, uh, where we'll conclude the Syrian Wars. We'll also talk about the recent Duma chemical attacks and the missile strikes uh, from April 2018. Once again, thanks for listening. Please leave a five-star review. Uh, Only takes seconds, but it really does help. As I always say, the success of any new podcast relies on its listeners. Please be generous. Uh, Think of it good, your good day, day to day. Uh, Leave us five-star review. Share, follow, uh, like us. Uh, We're on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. We're at B History Podcast. Please reach out to us. We will read out the reviews. Uh, Let us know how we're getting on. And um, uh, please carry on listening. Uh, We are on all major iPod uh, podcasts and Apple. Uh, We're on uh, all the major directories. Please subscribe. Um, and uh, you'll get notified when our next episode is released. We do release on a Tuesday every week, um, so look out for uh, part three next week. I'm really interested to hear what you think of part two and part one already. And this has been the Brief History Podcast. Brief history, comprehensively packed in under an hour, perfect cue for your commute home, on your lunch break, or in your precious time. Bye.